Hey, good evening. It's Pastor Mary. I'm sitting outside our new house. Sitting out on the back area. Uh, let's see if you can see. That's our backyard. Um, it's uh, lovely here and it's a beautiful night. It's been a beautiful day. Hey, Bill. Good to see you. And I'm sure Kathy's not far behind. Um, good evening, Betty. And I'm sure Matthew's not far behind. Uh, so it's good to be with you this evening. I know there's other people that will watch you in the morning. I'm trying to, let's see, I'm trying to get this all situated. The people who owned this house before left us their uh, outdoor. All right, let's hope. I We got everything connected up. Um, hey, Kathy, we got everything connected up with the internet. They came, yeah, oh gosh, all the days are flowing together, Wednesday. I think they came yesterday and was working on it and uh, it took a little bit but they got it so hopefully we'll see how the connection is i hope it's good um i went and got a haircut today so that was a thrill uh i have a very lovely hairdresser uh she is the granddaughter of a friend from david's church hey matthew how are you sweetie hey laura good evening good evening well it doesn't seem to be as connecting as good here so we'll see if it, if it does it again i'll go inside um yeah, yeah, Ellie, this is our backyard. I was saying this is our backyard. So there's a lot of open space here. So um, whenever things are safer, we will have a, a garden party as Joan had. Good evening, Ellie. Good evening, April. Um, and uh, we'll have a blessing of our house, but it'll probably be sometime in the fall that we'll do that. So we'll just wait to, for things to change and... Uh, we, it's the third time I'm having a problem. So if it does it again, then I'm going to go in because the connection's better inside. So anyway, but I was saying, yeah, I got a haircut. I We went and got groceries. I made my first, uh, we cooked our first meal in the house uh, tonight because we, we've been just picking up food because it's been so crazy and busy. And um, I made, I know this isn't what you expected devotions, but I made a, a recipe called pork chops a la pizziola. And so um, you uh, cook your pork chops on both sides for three to four minutes, and then you take them off, and you put your seasonings, whatever you want on it, and then you, uh, I caramelized some onions, uh, large slices, uh, you know, diced, not diced, but the large, and then um, for about three or four minutes, and then I add a can of diced tomatoes, and I add a little Whatever seasoning you want, I put a little few red pepper flakes, salt, pepper, garlic, salt, uh, thyme, Italian seasoning, you know, all that kind of stuff. You get that nice and uh, warm, and then you add the pork chops back in, and you cook it uh, probably on like three, four, lower, uh, for about 15 minutes, and then you have it for dinner. So that's what we had for dinner tonight with salad and fruit salad. We always have fruit salad every night, and vegetable or two every night so it was really really good so good evening Don good evening Phyllis good evening Diane uh, I'm making sure I say hi to everybody that pops up on here um, and I'm sure there's other people too but anyway so uh, so and then getting some things for the house um, just things that you don't think about and then you move in the house is different and you go oh well we need that we need that we I gotta do this and I had to take something back um something for the shower we needed something to hold everything but we have we have very high ceilings Pe you know people look have looked at the pictures and think the house is really big well it's got very high it's super open in the um living room area very open in the staircase to go upstairs is there i'll take a few pictures and and post those but um but our bathroom is also very high and so i tried to buy something that was a pole that would hold um, things on it to hold shampoos and all that stuff. And it didn't work because it was at a weird angle. So anyway, I took that back today. And so I've been out about, but I wore my mask everywhere. Um, it was great in my hairdressers. They could only have one client at a time. They don't serve any drinks. She usually gives me water. You have to bring your drink in clothes. I had on my mask the whole time. She had hers on, but it, it was great. And I was so happy. I love getting... A haircut and I especially love getting my hair my head massage when they shampoo me so that was really 
really, really wonderful. I was like, oh, I'm just so glad uh, to get my hair cut and um, enjoy it. So, um, I wanted to I wanted to talk a little bit more about 1 Corinthians 13, actually. We talked some last night, but I shared, if you heard last night, I shared a lot about my friend, Stephanie. Um, I'm very happy to say that uh, I, I put it on my Facebook page and I um, put Stephanie's name on it, Stephanie Herzog Side, Side Singer. And um, she, she got to read it and she wrote me a really lovely note. Um, and she said she'd like to come visit in the winter because if you know anything about Rochester, New York, uh, they are one of the big snow capitals of the country. They just get tons and tons of snow every winter. Whenever there's like, it's going to the East Coast, they get a ton. So she wrote me back a really, really nice note. And it was, it was really special for me to be able to remember, uh, that wonderful time in my life and, and what a great experience it was to work in Yosemite and to lead worship in Yosemite. Um, I'll just share one other little story from Yosemite because um, there's lots of them. But this was, a uh, for me, it was a um, life-changing uh, moment. Um, so I, I did not grow up Lutheran. I grew up in another tradition. Uh, many of you know that tradition. Uh, I did not grow up with the idea of ever wanting to be a pastor, ever wanting to serve. That way, I taught serve with you uh, sometime either earlier in the week or last week about taking social work classes. And I really thought I was going to be a social worker. And the story how I became a, how I went to seminary is another story. I won't share that today. But, um, but I will say that I always had a little, I had some doubt. And, um, and I really struggled at times about oh, whether God was calling me and, um, I, there was just, I just never asked the first time. I'm going to go in because I don't want it to be that you can't see me. So hang on. We're going to walk in the house. You're going to walk in with me. Uh, hang on. I'm not connecting well out here. We'll have to figure that out because I like to be able to do it outside. So we'll see what we can do. But anyway, hang on. I'm going to talk inside. So I need you to be quiet. Okay. You can go up to your room or you can go to the den and shut the door, okay? Okay. Oh, you can see my lovely arms. Not. Um, so hopefully the connection here will be better. Anyway, um, so, um, so anyway, I, I struggled a lot about whether God had called me or not. And, um, and I had talked to a professor about it one time. And I said, you know, do you, do you ever doubt... Do you ever question whether God, whether you feel called by God or not? And he really helped me a lot. Um, he's now Father Gabriel. He's a, now an Orthodox uh, priest in, uh, I think, New Mexico. Um, and I may have to um, put a note on this for him. But anyway, uh, he was a wonderful, wonderful professor, preacher, teacher. Um, but I was talking to him, and I said, you know... Do you, do you ever doubt? I mean, do you, do you ever question, you know, whether you feel called by God? And, and he said, Mary, there's not a week goes by that I'm not, that I don't doubt it. And I was like, okay, okay, that's okay. It's the human condition to, to doubt and to struggle, you know, as to whether God calls you to do things or say things or be a part of things. Um, and that really helped me. So that summer in Yosemite, I told you I led worship services outdoors. And, um, and so one Sunday I led worship and after worship, um, I had this gentleman who was at worship and he waited till everybody left. And then he said, well, I, I'd like to sit down and talk with you. And I, you know, I didn't know him and I said, oh, okay. So we sat down and he said, well, he said, I, I'd like to talk to you about what the Bible says about women, uh, leading in churches. And I knew where it was going to go. And I said, um, I said, let's, let's just stop right here, okay? I said, I, I understand that uh, you obviously don't think I should be leading worship with men. And um, I could tell that's where he was going. And I said, but there's no reason for us to have a conversation. I said, um, I, I feel called by God. My church feels that I'm called by God. 
um, meaning the denomination my synod. Um, and I said, and um, you and I just see scripture differently. And I said, there's nothing you can say that's going to change my mind. Um, so th thank you, but um, no, thank you. Let's just go our own ways and, and it's okay. And, for, and surprisingly, he, he went on. He didn't say much more. He just went on. Um, and I will say, he's not the first person, nor will he ever have been the last um, who's questioned me as to whether me as a woman, God could call. And, um, that's really been a big part of my journey is the struggle to be accepted by different people. And I will say I've had many more women be vocal that they did not, um, think I should be a minister or, or they'd say, well, you're the first woman minister I've ever met. I'd be, I'd be rich and retired. Um, if I got $5 for every person that said that to me, um, and I, I just got to the point where I was like, well, okay, you know, but I was hoping they wouldn't base their view of women ministers on me because I just don't feel that's very fair. But anyway, that was a real turning point for me. That was kind of like an inner, the inner struggle had come to realize that God, that I did feel a call from God. That doesn't mean do a perfect job doesn't mean I don't make people mad doesn't mean people agree with everything I say um but I just it really it like solidified the call that God had given me so um and I think you know thinking about first Corinthians 13 some more um I think the thing about it is that sometimes I think we think love we that in order to love somebody we have to agree with them we have to see the world the same way they do. We have to have the same viewpoint. Um, and it may be that the people that are closest to us are like that. But if any of you have kids or any of you have close friends that are family or family who have different viewpoints than you, who see things 180, totally different than you, my question to you is, do you still love them? And, you know, it can get in the way of our relationship because it's easy to give each other a hard time. It's easy to get in arguments with each other. It's easy to put each other down. Um, I was just so struck today, um, all the places I went and the kindness of people just in their, just in their everyday work, just very kind and and i just thought you know sometimes we try harder with strangers than we do with our family and our friends because we have too much baggage and we let the baggage get in the way of loving each other but if we listen to this love never fails never fails god is love jesus is love the holy spirit is love God's love never fails us. We may feel it fails us at times when things don't turn out the way we expect, when unexpectedly bad things happen to us, when there are struggles or strife. Um, you know, we may, we may feel that. Um, I, I know sometimes when if people are upset with me and they don't tell me and then I find out from somebody else they were upset with me, my heart is so heavy with that. Um, it, feels, it feels so painful. Um, and, and I will say it's happened to me a number of times, um, in ministry especially. Um, but I think part of, of Scripture and of Paul writing this is to remind people that love is at the heart of our faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Really amazing to think about. God loved the whole world. God loved all people. God loved people of every color, of every nation, of every tribe. God loved and loves everyone. And the question is, do we see it? Do we recognize it? Do we hold on to it? 
Do we live it out? Do we, with the Holy Spirit, do we live love? Do we seek forgiveness? It says it does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. How many times are we rude to the people we love the most? Or snarky, like not funny snarky, but intentional snarky. How many times do we just get angry? And we let ourselves. How many times do we have a bad day? You know, this scripture passage is very powerful. And it's a reminder to us all that in this time and age, we need to work on being a little more patient with each other. A little more kinder. A lot more kinder. Love covers a multitude of sins. The question is, are we willing to love that way? Are we willing to love with our whole heart and our whole soul and our whole mind? Are we willing to do that? Sorry, I'm inside and Christopher's Christopher's in the other room and it's open, so anyway, but I and I don't think I read the part because it wasn't on there, but the part of um when I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man or a woman, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now we only see in part. We only see part of the story. We only see a little bit. We don't know at all. There's a lot of pain and anguish and anger in our world. And our job is not to ignore it, not to act like it's not there. Our job is to try to understand, to be patient, to listen, to be kind, to seek reconciliation, to bring hope. You know, I talked about hope a couple days ago and Sharon um, put a note on about we have to have hope and I think she's so right. We have to have hope and we need, I need a double dose of hope these days. A double dose of hope that we'll find a way to um, get to the other side of COVID-19 and yet I know that this is a journey we're on and um, looking out for other people means you may have to give up your liberty of not wearing a mask so you could protect someone else around you. But when we love, we are willing to do things that maybe we don't want to do in order to protect others and to care for them. Um, in this time, we need another dose of hope and love in seeking reconciliation in finding a new way to live together in this world where people of color are held in equal esteem, are treated the same as white people are. And there are lots of instances where that's not happening. And I'm not gonna get into anything about that, but to say that I want to encourage all of us to be willing to listen. We don't have to fix everything, but listening goes a long way in helping people through difficult times. And so if we can listen, if we can do our part of loving and caring, then we're, we're living out what God has asked of us in this time to be healers, to be loving ambassadors for Christ. And I know that many of you are already doing that, and I encourage you to continue to do that in all the ways you can, in all the places you can, 
with all the people you can. And to keep living up that hope. Because now, now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. But I don't want to live without faith or hope either. Because what is life without hope? It's just a dark, difficult place to be. But faith, hope, and love. Uh, there's, there's a trinity worth holding on to every day, right? Like we hold on to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit or um, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Words, adjectives that ex describe more fully um, the Trinity. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. I want to encourage you in your life to continue to bring hope, to act on your faith, and to bring love. To be patient and kind, to be not rude or boastful, to treat each other as we want to be treated, with kindness and care and fairness and equality, with an open ear and an open heart, that we will do that for each other. And we'll do it for the stranger as well as we will do it for our family and our friend, and that if we have broken places in our lives that we will pray and seek reconciliation. And if you're not there, then I ask you just to be praying, praying for that person or persons because Jesus is very clear when he says, pray for your enemy, love them and pray for them and give them the shirt off your back if they need it. So that's it for sharing that tonight. Um, I know I'll be thinking about it more. And I'll look forward to talking more tomorrow night. Um, I did want to share, Susan Friend had shared last night, for those from um, St. John, that uh, Tuffy's uh, uh, brother had died. And he did. He died unexpectedly over the weekend. I talked to him, talked to Alan right after uh, we had devotions last night, and he said that um, his brother uh, died at home, and they revived him, and then uh, he died on the way, I think, either on the way or at the hospital, and they tried for 20 minutes, and they said that they couldn't bring him back, and so um, his brother died this weekend. Uh, he and his sister are... Uh, going through papers, looking for things. Um, his brother did not want a funeral, did not want a service. Uh, they're not sure what they're going to do. I encouraged him to do what was best for them because as I always say, and I say this to you all too, a funeral is not for the person who died. A funeral or a memorial or a celebration of life or a party is for the people left behind because... There's something about coming together and being able to remember someone we've cared about that helps us in our grief process. And even if it's just a few people gathered around, to be able to have that time to be able to process that way helps a lot. It gives us support. It gives us love. It helps us to know that other people cared about our loved one. It helps us to know other people care about us. But I, I told... Um, Tuffy, I said, you know, you, you all take your time and decide what you want to do. And if you want, even if you just want to have a few friends over to remember your brother, then do that. But right now, there's nothing planned. Uh, we don't know anything at this time. Um, but he did ask me to mention this to all of you. And so I said I would. And I'll probably write something about it um, just a little more in detail. But he said, please, please, please ask people put all their important papers together in one place and to make sure somebody else um, that they want to know, know where they're at. Because he said, we, we can't find things that we need and we can't find them. And um, he said, you know, it, it would be so much easier. And I said, I would. Uh, we keep ours all together, although they're in a box with us having moved. But... Um, 
I find the more that you could prepare for when the time comes that you will no longer be here, the better it is for your loved ones. And this is just my theory, but a lot of people I feel like don't want to do that stuff because it's almost like saying, yeah, I'm going to die. But you know what? We're all going to die. And I have found in my work as a pastor and as a hospice chaplain that the more that is known beforehand, uh, the better, because I've had um, friends in my life and people, church people in my life who went into comas and near the end and also came to the point where they couldn't talk anymore. Uh, my mom was pretty much that way at the end. Um, a woman that I really, that's what led me into wanting to do hospice, um, Pam Evans from Illinois. Um, she had throat cancer three times and uh, I think I've shared a story about her, but I'll share it another time. A wonderful story about the third time that she survived. She didn't think she would survive, but um, after the doctor told her that she only had a few months to live, she had me come over to her house and had her whole family there. She loved communion. Love, love, loved communion. She loved it so much. I don't know that I've shared this, but she loved it so much that when she couldn't eat anymore and she had a G-tube in, she had me put communion in her G-tube. That's how much she loved communion. She wanted to have communion. And even if she couldn't taste it anymore, she wanted communion. But um, so we had we had service at her home, Matt had a worship service, I had communion. Um, and then an, a week later, I was over at her house with her cousin, who was another person from my church. And... Um, we were talking because Pam had always said she wanted to be cremated. And so Tom, her husband had said, oh yeah, well, she wants to be cremated. So we said to Pam, so is that what, is that what you want? And she goes, no, I was just kidding. I don't want to be cremated. I want to be buried. And we're like, well, it's a good thing we had that conversation because you would have been cremated. Um, so, you know, I'm just saying it doesn't hurt to make your wishes known to loved ones. It doesn't hurt to write them down. It doesn't hurt to pick out a few hymns. And if you even can have a copy of the hymn, because sometimes they're so old or not known by other people, you know, I'm just saying it's a lovely, loving thing to do for your family is to prepare for when you will no longer be here. And speaking of which, um, I want to remind those who live in the Griffin area, there will be a celebration of life for Mary Johnson's husband, Leonard, this coming Saturday at the Gun Club. Uh, the address is Locust Grove, but it's on the border, I think, of Griffin and Locust Grove. It'll be at 2 p.m. You all are invited. We in invite you, to, if you can, if you're coming, to wear a mask. Um, and if you can't come or don't feel comfortable coming, we more than understand. But I just want to let you know that, that there will be a celebration um, for Leonard. And um, I know that it will mean a lot to Mary if you reach out to her, if you're not able to come, if you haven't already done so. I also mentioned about communion. Um, about um, Pam loving communion so much. And I will share, this is my decision because I, I am serving as pastor and um, communion uh, things are pa a pastoral decision. And um, if you are someone in the area who would like communion, uh, we're not having drive-by, we're not having worship in the church, but if you would like communion before I go away July 1st, I would ask you to text me or call me um, and I will make arrangements to bring you communion or meet you uh, with communion. Um, but I feel that if you are ready and are willing, I will do everything to be cautious and, um, and I will be glad to uh, bring you communion like I would bring it to somebody's home. So you can reach me for more details uh, call me or text me. I will be in the office tomorrow. I will be in the office next Tuesday and next Thursday, and then I'll be in the following Tuesday on the 30th of June before I leave. Um, but I I wanted to share that. Uh, some of you have really wanted communion. I did not feel comfortable before, um, but I feel like if it's one or it, two or your family and um, that we can do it safely, and I would be glad to uh, give you communion. I will not stick in your mailbox, but I will, um, I would be glad to come by for a short period of time. I have done a couple of visits 
I have shared communion with a few people and I feel that in order to be, um, that I should offer to anyone who might want it, but I'm not going to have a big crowd. We're not doing that. Um, but if you would like communion, please, please get a hold of me and I will work things out with you to be able to uh, share communion with you. So, um, that's it for tonight. I'm still looking for my prayer book. I put it in a bag. I hopefully will find it tonight and I'll be able to share with you, uh, tomorrow. Um, I don't know of any prayer requests at the moment, except for the ones that I've been sharing uh, with you. And if you have, again, if you have prayer requests, please send those to me. Um, call me, email me, call the church, um, text me. Um, and if you don't reach me and leave me a message, I'll get back to you as soon as I can, okay? Um, but I'm glad to have you join me tonight. Um, keep loving, keep bringing hope. Uh, keep seeking reconciliation. Keep being open to other people, even people who are different from you or I. Uh, maybe someone has a different viewpoint or a different way of looking at it. We can still love each other. Um, we don't have to see the whole world the same way in order to love each other. Um, and I hope and pray that all of you uh, who are watching the evening will have a blessed evening uh, and will have good rest tonight. And for those of you who watch in the morning or the afternoon, I pray that you are having a great day. And, uh, and I look forward to being with you tomorrow night. And now before we go, let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you for loving us the way you do, for creating us out of your love. And we ask that you would remind us what 1 Corinthians 13 said to the community of Corinth and says to us today, to be patient, to be kind, to not be boastful, to not be arrogant, to be forgiving, to be patient, and to... Just share that love with each other and look at each other if we need to with new eyes. Thank you for loving us that way. Thank you for forgiving us each and every day. Thank you for giving us hope in a time when it seems that there is little to no hope. Thank you for walking us through the good and the most difficult days of our lives and help us to know that we are never alone, that you are always with us and that your love will go before us and in us and will see us through. Help us to welcome the stranger, to greet them, to love them, to care for them. And now, God, whatever else is on our hearts, we lift to you tonight, and we trust it all in your care. And we also pray for Alan and his sister and all those who knew his brother, and we just pray that you would give them comfort in this time. And for all these things and more, we lift them to you, and we trust them in your care. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, dear family, dear friends, dear loved ones, have a great night. Have a great day tomorrow, and we'll see you again here tomorrow. Hope you're doing well. Good night.